By the way, it's my first time here in Sofia, but unfortunately, I will stay just a little bit. I have, after this talk, to travel back to Barcelona to present a Istio workshop tomorrow. So as you can see, th there are a lot of conference, there are, there are a lot of people worldwide that, that want to consume this kind of, of uh, content. So I'm really happy to be here, and I want to share that with you. By the way, if you want to have access to the slides, and please let me know if I'm talking uh, too fast, okay? Just say, slow down. Uh, it's because we have so many content to, to present in a small amount of time. But the slides are available at this link here. So if you go to bit.ly slash istio dash Kubernetes, you will see the slides that I'm using here, okay? Because there will be a lot of cool content. So, uh, before starting this talk, uh, how, how many of you are Java developers? Oh, almost everyone, nice. Uh, I want to talk to you about the Red Hat Developers Program, which is this website, developers.redhat.com, where you can find free, free, totally free resources for developers. You can get free ebooks, just like this one from Edson Yanaga. Edson was here last year, uh, migrating microservice to database. Introducing, introduction, and introducing Istio Service Mesh for microservice from Christian Post and Burr Sutter. And also my book, Microservice for Java Developers, second edition. I rewrote uh, this book to include microprofile, uh, camel, open tracing. So yeah, a lot of cool content. By the way, talking about, about microprofile, if you adopt microprofile, you will be able to use Quarkus. Have you heard about Quarkus? Yeah? For those who haven't heard about Quarkus, let me show you a quick demo. Because, let me increase the font size here just a little bit. And let me create a Quarkus project. It's just, uh, we will just use this Quarkus Maven plugin. So let me make sure that the font is large enough. Create the name of the group ID, artifact ID, a class name, and a path. Nef nothing special here, right? It's a, just a, a simple Maven project called Getting Started. That I will just do a Maven clean package. Nothing special, just regular Maven package. But, uh, of course, there will be tests here. And then let me, let's, let's run this project. So, target. First, look the size of the jar file here. Getting started, runner.jar. 42K. Okay, impressive. Okay, but there is a, uh, some libraries here. But seven megs of library. It's so it's smaller than Node.js. But let's run Java Dashar, getting started runner, and it started in 0 0.6 six, uh, 629 seconds, less, uh, almost half second, and it's working. I can go here to my browser, and it's not a lazy startup. I can do localhost 8080, and there is a web page here. I can access hello. I can even do, for example, let me do a command here. Um, while you true, do curl this page, sleep, um, sleep I, I, I will increase the font size. Sleep for 0.2 seconds, step one line, done. So you, I will start again, so you can see that's not a lazy startup. It's a Java application running in less than one second, and it's not only about that. If you take a look here, at the activity monitor and look for the Java process, we can see that's consuming 
less than 100 megs of RAM. So it's really impressive. Plus, it's so fast that I can go here to the Java source code. So let's close this window. Do a Maven Quarkus dev, which is the development mode. And now that I'm, I have the, the application running here, right? Well, let me do something here. Let me open the source code. Oops. The uh, Quarkus dev mode allows uh, the project to be to watch the files. So, for example, let me make sure that's running. Okay, I will open this source code here and change hello to uh, Hi Sophia. Save, refresh, and it's there. So it's so fast that it it, it watches the file and restarts this whole application server. So it's amazing. It's amazing technology, and we will will we will use that for the demo today. Okay. So I just want to share with you all because uh, I saw that most of everyone here are Java developers, and if you are really interested about this technology, you can go to Quarkus.io. Okay. Uh, here you can see that uh, some comparisons of the startup time and con memory consuming about the Java application. We are not talking about Node.js. It's faster, it's smaller, and it's Java. OK, but let's talk about Istio. We are here to see Istio running and working. So it, when we decide to uh, adopt microservice, there are certain uh, evolution process that we need to go. First, we need to reorganize our team to adopt DevOps practices. Then we, can, we need to have a self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure. That would be the next step. Because with elastic infrastructure, you can, uh, with elastic infra uh, inf infrastructure, and with automation, because our team is now producing, uh, it's using DevOps practices, we can start in having a CI and CD deployment pipeline. If we have CI CD deployment pipeline, the next step of the evolution process is advanced deployment techniques. Then, finally, who knows, you can become the next Silicon Valley unicorn. Of course, if you adopt Kubernetes, OpenShift, and Istio that we will see today, you will have a lot of unicorn love. Why? Let's think for a moment what we had until now. Until now, most of us, we were producing a monolithic application. Of course, inside this monolithic application, we had modules. But we decided that they shouldn't be together. We decided to create microservice. And of course, because they don't live together, we decided to spread them in different nodes, in different machines, in different hosts that creates a network of services, a service mesh. And of course, if each microservice have their own data, right? they can have multiple points of entry, multiple pipelines, because we will not get our jar file and throw over the wall. We need to get our source code from the Git repo, make it go through a, a, a pipeline to reach the production. So for every microservice, you will have a pipeline. So let's recap the, some microservice principle. If we decided to implement a microservice here with everyone, we would, we would divide in teams, trying to achieve what? To achieve agility. Uh, and we achieve agility by having deployment independence. So one team not big enough to, uh, not small enough to, to have a, a two pizza, or too big enough that uh, to, to have a, uh, also not big enough or not small enough for a two pizza. So that's why we all often hear the term two pizza team. We will have those teams producing microservices. And we cannot wait for the other team. We need to release faster. The, the, this microservice needs to be independently deployed. So that's why we are talking about uh, projects 
uh, products that have customers, not projects, and they are all focused on the API because they need to communicate. Of course, sometimes the API can, can change. That's why we need, we need evolutionary design. The other customer or the other server might not be available. That, that's why we need to um, uh, design for failure. So this is just a recap of, of some microservice principle. So nowadays, we are producing microservices. It's kind of old school to produce uh, monolith. Of course, uh, there are certain uh, moments or certain projects or certain uh, use cases that will require just a monolith. But in a new school, we'll get those microservices, place them inside a container, and get those containers running on OpenShift or Kubernetes, and that's the, what's called the new school. But because one microservice needs to talk to another microservice, uh, for example, like you can see here in this picture, a microservice A will call microservice B that will call microservice C. In fact, it's the same principle that we learned at, at, the, the, uh, at the computer school. It's all about distributed computing. So when we have distributed computing, when we have A talking to B, we tend to, f uh, to fall on some fallacies. For, for example, well, here we are connected to the network, right? But the uh, network might not always be available. If the Wi-Fi goes down, we, I will not have access to the slides. So I need to trust on the Wi-Fi. But if I was running this demo on, on a cloud in North America, there would be a latency. So the latency is not zero. The bandwidth is not infinite. The topology can change. Uh, we tend to think that there is one administrator. And it's not. We have several administrators for this Wi-Fi here. There is a cost. So most of the time, we think that we are running local. So when we have distributed computing, we have some fallacies. And that fallacies make, can make us fail because when, if you, a service, a single service fail, we could have a cascading failure. And we do not want that, right? We don't want a cascading failure in our environment. So what we do, we place certain capabilities inside those microservices, right? So for example, to A talk to B, it needs to locate the service. So we need a service discovery. Of course, I can have multiple replicas of B. So that's why I need, A need, needs a load balancer to send the request to all replicas. I need the resilience because B cannot be, uh, uh, must not be available all the time. I need metrics. I need to know how health is my microservice. I need tracing because when I have a monolithic, if there's something wrong, I will have a single stack trace. But for distributed computing, I need distributed tracing as well. So I need tracing. So what we do nowadays, we place those things inside the microservice. But let's recap also the history of microservice. If we remember well, we can see that in 2006, the cloud was born with Amazon. Then for us, Java developers, uh, Drop Wizard and Vertex um, became very popular in 2011 with the fat jars. Then Netflix went open source in 2012, releasing their projects, Ribbon, Hystrix, and Eureka. And that made the, oh, everyone want to uh, be like Netflix. Everyone wants to, be, to produce microservices. And then there was the perfect storm for microservices. We had containers with Docker. We have Spring Boot. We have Kubernetes. And microservices was defined. So that was perfect. And everyone went crazy, want to produce in microservices. <laughs> so you th if you think well, you see that all, everything started with Netflix. But what's wrong with Netflix? Netflix is Java only. It adds a lot of libraries to your code. So if you want to produce microservices using Netflix, oh, Netflix OSS, and you are not a Java developer, you will need to look for certain libraries that do 
the same F, uh, of Netflix OS has. And let's think for a moment. No matter if we are a Java developer, if we are a Node developer, a Vertex, um, um, Go, or a Python developer, a Perl developer, if we are producing microservice, we need to produce all those things. We need to have a clear API, right? API is easy. Then we need a discovery mechanism. We need a way to find that microservice in the cluster. We need a way to invoke that microservice. Is it REST? Is it messaging? Synchronous or, or asynchronous? So we need to think about that. We need to take care about the elasticity because the microservice and the infrastructure, infrastructure needs to sh shrink and grow. We need resilience. We need a pipeline, as I told you. We need to get the source code and place it on production using a pipeline. Not every microservice is public, so we need authentication. We need a logging. We need monitoring. We need to know what's happening inside all those hundreds of, of microservices. And we need tracing. So fortunately for us, there is Kubernetes and OpenShift. Because if you adopt Kubernetes, you will have discovery for free. Kubernetes has a, discovery, a service discovery mechanism embedded inside the, the Kubernetes. If you, have, if you adopt Kubernetes, you have invocation for free. You have elasticity for free. And plus, if you use OpenShift, you will have monitoring, logging, and pipeline also for free. So what else we are missing? For those pieces, we can use Istio. So what is Istio? Istio is a service mesh implementation. OK, so what is a service mesh? To the, uh, instead of reading the slides here, just let's think, think that a service mesh is when you have an uh, infrastructure besides your application. So imagine that I am the application. And just on my side, I have an infrastructure that will take care of every inbound and outbound communication. And we will manage that. So with Istio, we will have a better service discovery, and I'll show you that. We have a resilience mechanism. I'll show you that as well. We have authentication. We have monitoring, and we have tracing for free. So us, for develop, uh, that we are developers, instead of taking care about all those things, we just produce the API and let Istio, Kubernetes, and OpenShift take care of the rest. So before Istio, we placed everything inside our microservice. But after Istio, we ha will have all those capabilities placed inside a sidecar container. So this sidecar container will intercept all inbound and outbound traffic using IP tables, right? So it, it, it will use IP table rules to get the, the, the traffic process inside the sidecar container, and then the sidecar container will send the information to the application, right? And this sidecar container is, has a proxy, a, a proxy called Envoy. So let me show you Envoy here, Envoy proxy. So Envoy is an open source edge and service proxy designed for cloud native application applications. So it's really fast, it's really lightweight, and it talks HTTP 1, HTTP 2, gRPC, and for everything else it talks TCP. So it's really high level proxy. So yeah, this is a sidecar container where when you have uh, infrastructure uh, close to your application. And then what you will achieve? A code independent infrastructure to handle intelligent routing and load balancing. Uh, so for example, you can do uh, better, smarter, uh, better A-B tests. So I can release an application uh, that only this row here will see. Then I will re release another version of the application that only this row will see. And another application that, uh, another version of the application that only the third row will see. 
So we can perform that with uh, Istio. I will show that to you. Uh, how we will we know that our application is failing? We will know by uh, only when it fails. So we can inject chaos on our microservices. We can have resilience, we can have observability, and all managed in a fleet-wide policy enforcement. Okay, talk is cheap, so show me. But be sho before showing to you, uh, let's understand how Istio works. For every side container, so suppose that we have 100 of microservices, you will have 100 of proxies, Envoy proxies running together with your application. To manage that application, you have what is called a control plane. The control plane uh, uses the pilot to receive the configuration from the user, and it sends all the configuration to, the, to the all proxies. In the other hand, the mixer will collect the information for what? For quota, for example. Suppose that I, want, uh, I have a microservice that, is, uh, ex uh, that can handle 10 requests per second. I can write a rule in Istio and say, if there is more than 10 requests, deny, because I, my microservice will not be able to handle more than 10 requests per second. I can do that. And how I know that there are uh, 8, 9, 10, 11 requests, because the mixer collect the inf the, that information. Bet uh, between the microservice, you can uh, encrypt the communication, so uh, using uh, digital certificates. That's why there is Istio Citadel here. And the galley is responsible to uh, check if the configuration is valid. So nowadays, in 2019, you don't need Eureka, you don't need uh, Ribbon, you don't need Hystrix, you don't need to manually use open tracing because you have open tracing for free if you use Istio. So let's take a look on that. Observability uh, using Grafana. So let me show what I have here. Uh, let's close Quarkus. And I have three microservices running inside my cluster. I have a microservice called cu uh, Customer, Preference, and Recommendation. And there is a loop here that every time that it, it access, it increases the counter. The, those microservices are deployed here, as you can see. But if I go to the Istio installation and open Grafana, I can see the results of the, the commands that I'm running here. So I can see the request volume to operations per second, uh, details ab about the inbound and outbound communication of the microservice. I can see every detail here of my microservice for free. I didn't write anything related to collect that. Istio is collecting that automatically for myself, OK? What else? Uh, besides Grafana, I can have Kiali. Kiali was a project, it's a donation of, uh, of a project from Red Hat to Istio, and now it's part of Istio installation. So you can see, for example, a graphic information here. And I can say, for example, show the traffic animation, show what else, request percents per, per total, and I can see how my traffic is going from one side to another side. So customer going to preference, going to recommendation. And here I can see also some statistics about the how, may, how many requests are made with 400 errors, with 300, uh, HTTP 300, 500 errors. Uh, uh, until now, everything is OK. I'll keep this open because uh, we will use Kiali uh, more. Uh, we have open tracing. As I said, I don't need to uh, install open tracing inside my application. I can come here and look for every request that was made. So, for example, if I open here, I will see customer calling preference, calling recommendation. 
And why there are so many customers here? It's because it also traces uh, what's placing, uh, when the traffic is going inside the, the proxy. So before call, uh, the, my application calling, call, before my application calls pref, uh, preference here, it will go to the proxy. So we have that for free. So everything here has been uh, collected automatically by Istio for free. Ah, and also Prometheus. So let me open Prometheus. And I can even use here, for example, base, uh, memory, max heap, graphic, And yeah, I can see the details of my application here uh, and every other metric that's capable, like container memory, graph. Yeah, let's don't lose too much time on getting data from Prometheus, because as you can see, I, can, I have a bunch of metrics that I can use. So, I have here the version one of recommendation, right? And I want to release the version two. How many of you are familiar with Kubernetes? Cool. So if I show you that, uh, this file here, if I go to recommendation and show Kubernetes deployment v2. You can see that's just a regular YAML file, right? That has a deployment of recommendation v2 that uses this image here, example recommendation v2, right? So let's create this, uh, this uh, image here. Uh, and as I said, I have several projects here. I can use Java with different Flavors, of course, I will use Quarkus. I told you that I would use Quarkus, and I will create my application. So, Maven package. Oh, by the way, let me modify it to instead of v1, say v2, right? So, let's change this to v2. Maven clean package. Okay, now I will use this Docker file here to create my uh, image. So it's called example by dash recommendation v2 uh, and use the local Docker file. Okay, now I have the image, Docker image, grab recommendation. So I have v2. That was built five seconds ago. Okay, five seconds ago. And now, if I use that, doc, that deployment YAML, I will, of course, deploy the, the version two, but without the, the sidecar container. I, I have two ways of injecting a sidecar container. First, is enable the automatic injection but running the command kubectl lab label namespace, the name of the namespace, and create a label saying istio injection enable. That, uh, that label in the namespace will cause every container in that namespace to have the sidecar container. But I want to teach you how is that performed under the hood. So I use the command istio ctl kube inject in the name of the uh, deployment YAML file. So let me run the command here. Istio.ctl, cube inject. Can you see the, the font size? Let me increase a little bit. Cube inject and the name of the, that deployment YAML. So Kubernetes, oops. Kubernetes, deployment v2. That creates an output. 
So let me save that output to deploy with istio-yaml. Okay. Now I, I can let me just compare using GIF the those two files so you can see what has changed. So deployment v2 and deploy with Istio. So what has changed here? If you take a look here, uh, my the, my YAML file has been modified to include what? The proxy. So you can see here that now my pod has two containers inside. One has the proxy uh, and the application. You can see that it mounts the volume to receive the proxy configuration. Another volume to receive the digital certificates. Uh, it points to the Istio pilot that's running. So now, if I deploy that file with kubectl create-f deploy with Istio, you can see that recommendation v2 has been created. We can go to the tutorial here and see the recommendation v2. It's the pods being started. And once that it starts, we start seeing v2 here with a new counter. OK? So that's how you create a, a, new, a new application with uh, the sidecar container. And you can see here, for example, two containers inside that pod. The container is your proxy and the container recommendation. If I want to get the logs, I will see the logs of the application here or the logs of the Istio proxy. So you can see that it's handling the internal, the outbound in and outbound communication. OK, that's easy. So let's see what we can do with Istio now. First, let's do a simple traffic control, a blue-green deployment. So imagine, wh what is a blue-green green deployment? It's when I place um, a version on production, right? I get my, a version just like I built here, version 2. I place it on a production, and then I can just switch the key, uh, show to everyone the version green. If something go goes wrong, show uh, the version blue. So let's send all requests to recommendation v2. So let me return here. I will run a script here that does a blue-green deployment v2. And let me show what is inside this script. It will apply two rules, two files. One contains, uh, it creates namel, names for uh, what's called subsets. So I have two subsets here. One is called version v1 and another one called version v2. The version v2 is everything, uh, is every pod with the label version v2. Version v1 is every pod with the label v1. What else? Now that we have the subsets, I can apply a rule saying uh, create a, uh, creating a virtual service that will send every uh, this, uh, when the destination route of HTTP is the recommendation with the subset v2. I want to send 100% of the traffic to there. So let's apply this configuration here. So take a look here. It's running v1, v2, v1, v2, right? So let's apply a script, blue-green deployment, recommendation, v2. OK? Now I just see v2. If I want to send everyone to v1, so suppose that v1 is wrong. I can send everyone to v1 now. And I didn't change the code. I didn't touch anything related to the cluster. I just sent a rule and the proxy uh, now do what I want. What else? If I delete the route, it will 
uh, if I delete the virtual service and the subset, now it backs to normal, v1 and v2, because that's the default of Kubernetes. It sends a traffic to one and another. OK, that seems to be simple, but let's get, uh, let's get advanced here. So imagine a canary deployment. Canary deployment is when you have a, a piece of software that, the, in fact, the history of canary deployment was because the British miner took small canaries in, inside the mine. If there was a gas leakage, they would know because the canary would stop singing. But fortunately, at that time, there was a canary resuscitator. So they closed the door uh, and opened the oxygen cylinder, cylinder so the canary would leave again. <laughs> That's good. So for in a software, a canary version is placed on production, and then you start sending requests to that version. And then you can increase the size of the canary until it becomes 100%. With Kubernetes, as you are seeing here, it's only 50-50%. It sends the traffic to v1, v2, v1, and v2. With Istio, I can control, I can say 9% of the traffic will go to v1, and 10% goes to v2. So let's do that. A canary deployment, 90, 10. So now, most of the time, you will see v1, and once in a while, you will see v2. Because here, v2, oops, oops, go, went. v2 again. So 90% of the uh, time, you will see v1. I can change that and say, now I want 75 and 25. You will see v1 more often. So yeah, now you can see v v2 uh, more frequently. Or I can even do something even special here. Let me show uh, Kubernetes um, is still files. Virtual service with Safari. Look here what I can do with Istio. If the header of my HTTP match with the, uh, the user agent is Safari, I can send the traffic to version v2. Everything else goes to v1. So let's do that. Now, my crow command is not Safari, so I'm, I just see v1 here. But my browser, if I open the endpoint here, I will see v2. And it doesn't matter how many times I refresh, I will always see v1. Oh, sorry, v2. Because inside my browser, my user agent has Safari on it. So imagine, you can release an application that only certain people will see based on, on what is in the header. Based on the header, for example, if you have a VIP customer, the VIP will see the VIP version of your application. So that's really cool, right? What else we can do with Istio? We can see that we can have smart canary releases. We can perform dark launches. So we can place something on production, but the user will never see the request. But the request is going to v2. So you can test if the v2 is performing well, uh, how is the memory and CPU consumption. Even if the user don't see v, uh, the, the v2 live. So for example, I will perform a dark launch of v2. OK? My user only receives requests from v1. But if I do oc get pods, let's get the logs here. oc logs dash f of this pod. Uh, I have two containers, so my container recommendation. You can see that v2, oops. Oh, come on, don't, don't fail on me. Dark launch. Recommendation. Oh, come on. It, it was supposed to have a V2 receiving the, the requests, but that's not a, not a big problem. 
Okay, now what about service resilience? Suppose that one microservice is failing. Uh, let's make v2 fail, okay? I will make uh, v2 starting failing. Now that v2 is failing, so let, let, let's first script retry fix. Uh, I have a special endpoint here that when I access it, v2 will start failing, right? So uh, the, 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 when I access it, all the following requests will return a 503 error. So let's make it fail. What's happening here is that I only see v1. Why? Because Istio tries to access v2. I can see it here. v2 is receiving the traffic now. But v2 is failing, so the Istio proxy tries again, lands in v1, and v1 is working. So I can only I only see v1, although v2 is failing. So it just discards the um, the failing request. I even can see that in Kiali. If I take a uh, look here in Kiali, I can see that v2 is failing. Right but I never see the request of v2 because it's retrying, retrying, retrying. Okay, so let's fix this. Now it's returning 200. And now, now I have the request of v2 also. Okay, what else we can do? What, what are the other things that we can do nicely with Istio? Chaos testing. So suppose my application, uh, I want to know what happens if my application is, is low. Or I want to know what my application, uh, how my application will behave if it's failing. I, want, I will only discover when it fails or when it's low. So I can inject chaos. And chaos became, became very famous with Netflix also, with their tools, chaos uh, monkey and now they released Chaos Kong. So let's inject a 503 error. Everything is working here, and instead of uh, modifying my source code as I did in the previous example, I can write a rule and make, for example, let me show what I will change here. Virtual service, uh, recommendation, uh, 503 error. I will make my uh, my application with uh, fail 50% of the time with the uh, error fi uh, 503. So let's apply that. Scripts 503 error 50% of the time. Now let's wait. Come on. Fail, fail. Ah, here, you can see. Now it starts failing. And suddenly, 50% of the time, you will see my application failing. So I can know what's happening. I can come here, for example, uh, at Kiali. And now uh, Kiali works with statistics. So let me update that to every five seconds. And see here that uh, the traffic is failing. Uh, I can see what's happening. I can see how it behaves. Now I want to say that uh, I want to make my v2 is low. So instead of fail, I want to make v2, every request to v2 is low. So you can see now that v1 is really fast, but for v2 it takes a while to to have the response. So it's waiting for v2. Uh, now rep v2 replied. So I, uh, now I know what happens with my microservice if it starts becoming slow. Because I made it slow without modifying my code or without placing uh, too many requests. I know what's, what will happen. So as you can see, Istio provide, provides us a lot of features uh, for our infrastructure. For example, uh, you saw here, I have customer that access preference that I can access recommendation. 
I can write an access control rule uh, that allows customer access preference, access recommendation, but recommendation cannot access customer, or recommendation cannot access preference. Preference cannot access customer. So that makes me have a certain uh, security in my microservice. Another thing, cool thing that you can do, imagine uh, that's a hacker uh, get, got access to your microservice and it starts to capture sensitive data and it's sending all those sensitive data to, to him. Most microservice communication are internal, right? So by default, Istio blocks all outside communication. If you want to have external communication, you need to say, okay, I want that communication with that host. For example, what I will do here is, let me open here. I will try to access an uh, API called World Clock API. The World Clock API allows me to get the time. So when I try to access, I will get 404 not found. No error, right? And unless it's a 404 error, it's not a 500 error. And you can think, what's happening? That's because the egress rule, so is to file, virtuals. I can configure to allow the communication to word clock API on the port 80. So let's do that. Let's allow that communication. So I created an egress rule. Now, I can, uh, if I access, I don't have a 404 error. Instead, I have a 200 access and the time now available to myself, right? So, yeah, you have security also for free with Istio. Okay, so if you are interested on in Istio, of course, this is uh, just a small amount of time to see all the details of Istio. So how you can learn Istio? You can get the book for free at developers.redhat.com. You can get Istio, Introducing Istio Service Mesh for Microservice. Or you can go to learn.openshift.com slash service mesh. In this URL here, you can try the microservice without installing uh, Istio locally. Uh, you have an OpenShift cluster. This is a, um, a web terminal that allows you to do everything that we did, canary deployment, dark, dark launches, etc. Or you can go to bit.ly slash Istio tutorial. There you have the sources that I used here. So you can uh, install customer with different uh, Java flavors. Or if you're not, uh, not a Java developer, you can use Node, you can use .NET. Everything will work because that's the purpose of Istio, being polyglot. And there is instructions to install locally on your machine. OK, so this is the end. But keep in touch because serverless is coming. I hope that you enjoyed. And we have one minute for questions. Um, and just don't forget to follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Rafa Benny. If you are too shy to ask here, I also receive questions by Twitter. OK? Thank you. <laughs> uh, by the way, while you think about the question, let me do a, self with you, a selfie with you all, and I will post that selfie on in this Twitter, so you can see yourselves. Say hi. Hey, nice. Any questions? I heard a yes. Yes, what's the overhead in terms of Kubernetes resources and performance overall? Let's say we have 20 microservices. So uh, the question is, what about the performance when you install Istio? Yes, and what's the overhead of terms of uh -huh. Kubernetes resources? Because when it comes to deployment, we need to spend some more resources. 
Yeah, nice question. So uh, not only about the, over, uh, the, the performance issues, but the overhead called because you have also a proxy running. Every application will have a proxy running. Uh, as I showed you, to you, Envoy Proxies is written in C. So it's native binary. It's very lightweight. There is almost none, oops, almost none uh, memory and CPU consumption. So it's re really little less uh, um, overhead. But there is a certain overhead to capture the tracing. So let me open the tracing here. Uh, when you install uh, Istio, you have two kinds of curve configuration. The development mode that will capture every tracing, or the production mode, mode that will capture just a small percentage of this uh, uh, of these the requests to place uh, to trace those small requests, okay? So you have uh, the production red installation of Istio. Okay. Any more other questions? I, I can't hear you. So uh, hold on a second. So I know that in OpenShift third version, Istio is not officially supported. Maybe this is officially supported by version four, or? Uh, it will be tech preview. Uh, in o so the question is, uh, what about the OpenShift support to Istio? Yeah. Uh, in 3.11 and 4.0, it, uh, it's uh, in a tech preview, which means that it's there to be tested, but don't trust it y yet on production. But you can try and support yourself. Of course, Red Hat will support you on the, uh, on the best effort, but there is no guarantee yet. Uh, I heard that it might be available for 4.1, not guaranteed, uh, and it should be released very soon. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I've got a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, first of all, thank you very much for the demos. They were very nice. Uh, my thank question you. is, how does Istio play with messaging integration? Because most of the examples were based on HTTP. W uh, sorry, would you mind to repeat again, uh, Yeah, how, how does Istio play with messaging integration between services? Because some of the functionality provided by Istio is complemented by some message brokers. So, my question is, can so we use it together? Okay, so the question is how Istio handles asynchronous traffic in a messaging for uh, if you're using a broker like AMQ and uh, Kafka yeah, exactly. and everything related. Well, since East, uh, the Envoy Prox handles HTTP, gRPC traffic, and when it's not HTTP or gRPC, it falls to TCP. So it will handle all this traffic as TCP connections. So of course you cannot. Uh, treat the headers of the messaging protocol, but you can uh, route the traffic based on host names and ports. OK? Thank you. Any other questions? So thank you so much once more.